Mastering Wealth Creation, insights from Andrew Woodward of The Investor's Way. In this episode of Biz Bites, we discuss the importance of mentors, financial literacy, and proactive investing strategies. The conversation also provides some insights into managing personal and business finances to achieve both financial security and retirement goals. So Andrew's journey alone from CEO to financial educator is also going to give you some fantastic insights. It's an episode you don't want to miss. Check out some of these excerpts before we get into it. Understanding what type of lifestyle they want to have, both now and in retirement, and what it's going to take to fund that in the event that you're you know, no longer working. So a lot of people will come with the idea that they don't want to work till they're 65. I'm very much about trying to get people to think about their money far more uh, consistently and be more proactive so that uh, they're growing their wealth consistently every month. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Biz Bites, proudly brought to you by Com Together, the people behind podcasts done for you, because we're all about exposing other people's brilliance. Don't forget to subscribe to Biz Bites and check out podcasts done for you as well in the show notes. Now, let's get into it. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Biz Bites. And Andrew, it's so great to be able to finally do this. We've kind of uh, been, we worked out, we've been, uh, we can have a bit of a laugh about it. We've been backing and forth for what, probably two years on trying to make this happen. And then um, for whatever reason, now is the right timing for it to happen. So uh, welcome to the podcast first. Well, Anthony, thanks so much for uh, having me on the podcast and being polite enough not to mention that it's probably been my fault more than yours that uh, it's taken this long to get here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's always there's always something that gets in the way. We all know about that, but uh, but all good. Great to have you here. And I suppose we should start off by asking you to, to explain a little bit more about who you are, what you do. Yes, yeah, so Andrew Woodward, founder of The Investor's Way. Uh, which is a business that uh, effectively is an educational business teaching people how to manage and grow their wealth. And uh, it came about uh, from a a business mentor challenging me uh, to teach people what I'd done for myself uh, when I was complaining to my business mentor that I wasn't loving what I was doing and I was the CEO of an organisation here in Sydney. And uh, look, we were doing some good things, but I just wasn't loving it. And this business mentor basically hit me between the eyeballs with the reality stick and said, uh, you know, he was part of multiple businesses and I just had one job. And he basically said to me, surely you can do more. And so I started it as a side hustle. And now it's the main gig of what I do um, to just keep me off the streets and and occupied because uh, I do live what I teach. I love that and I love the fact that sneaking away in there is having a mentor. Can I just unpack that for just a second yeah. before we get into the main bit because I'm always fascinated by that. I've had some interesting discussions with people online about this whole idea of mentors and some people have found a, found out are vehemently against the idea mm-hmm. of, a, of a mentor and I'm not quite sure why. Um, that's certainly not my stance on things. I've um, valued the mentors that I've had along the way mm-hmm. Uh, in my business, and um, there's probably you know two or three that stand out particularly. Um, I'm interested. How did you find m- the mentor, or did he find you? And or, or uh, and and also, uh, you know, you don't have to say who the person is, sure. but um, I'm I'm just interested in their in their approach and what they've actually meant to you for over a period of time. Yeah, look, it's it's actually a long and interesting story. So I'll give you the shortened version, though, but. Uh, I joined a cycling charity uh, to raise money for cancer research after my mother-in-law passed away from cancer. And I got quite um, proficient at raising money. And so I became um, known to the the board of the charity and ultimately the chairman of the charity who became the business mentor. And we just kind of connected well uh, and got friendly with each other. And uh, I was having conversations with him you know, whilst we're out riding our bikes, raising money for cancer research. And he just said to me one day, look, let's let's keep this conversation going beyond the, the bike ride. And uh, so I would go and see him 
uh, initially pretty sporadically, just every month or two, and we'd have conversations about what I was doing and what I wanted to do. And over the process of having those conversations, it was where he kind of you know, discovered that where my passion was and what I was doing were not aligned. And um, that's where that question or that, not really a question, but a, a very direct statement about, you know, go and do what it is that you love doing for yourself, but teach others to do it as well. That's where that all came about. And so it was effectively an informal arrangement that became more formal over time and more consistent over time. And um, he just, um, you know, really found that what I was you know, struggling with was I just wasn't in alignment with what I was doing and what I love to do. And so he put those pieces together for me. We're still friends. We don't necessarily catch up as often anymore from a business mentoring perspective. Um, but he um, was a very important factor in driving that um, development of my business. Hey, we hope you're enjoying listening to the Biz Bites podcast. Have you ever thought about having your own podcast, one for your business, where your brilliance is exposed to the rest of the world? Well, come talk to us at Podcast Done For You. That's what we're all about. We even offer a service where I'll anchor the program for you. So all you have to do is show up for a conversation. But don't worry about that. We will do everything to design a program that suits you from the strategy right through to publishing and, of course, helping you share it. So... Come talk to us, podcastdoneforyou.com.au. Details in the show notes below. Now, back to BizBytes. Yeah, the, I, I love the fact that what you're talking about there is purpose. Mm. And, um, you know, and, and you met with purpose. That's what I love about mm. that story particularly is that there was a purpose in what, you know, led you down the path of actually meeting in the first place. So when you've got those shared values and ideas in the, you know, it makes complete sense that those conversations continued on and yeah. went further. And, and clearly that person has had a significant influence on, you know, how you've shaped your business and the ability to do that. And I think often there are those people in our career that don't necessarily always get the raps mm. and they don't necessarily stick around for the long term either. I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if I've shared with uh, listeners before, but um I had, a, I'll call him more of a colleague rather than necessarily a mentor at, uh, in the early stages. And we uh, had been talking about things and I'd been working in a couple of different jobs um, over a number of years and he'd come across with me as, a, as an external person. And uh, he knew I'd taken on this contract and it was short term and we were having a discussion one day over coffee and he just said, you you've got to take the leap, go mm -hmm. out and do it yourself and do this, this and this. And this is how I got started. And he got me started in a networking meeting. That was his first thing is like, come in and do this. And whilst, you know, it was very sporadic and not official, never became official as a, as a true mentor in the, in that specific sense. It had that kind of influence on me in the, in the early days. So, uh, so without giving his full name out there, shout out to Chris, if you're listening yeah. in. And look, and I think you touch on a really important point. There is a time and a place for certain mentors. And, you know, with this particular mentor that I'm talking about, he was very much in the right place for me at the right time when you know that conversation started i've gone on now to have other people that are helping me with the development of my business which is not necessarily where his skill set necessarily is so i think you're right in that they don't have to be around for the long term but there's a time and a place for each you know, skill set that you need when you need it uh, and so you know for those people that are yeah, open to the idea of having business mentors that you don't need to be married to them forever uh, to get from them their skill set and their their benefit for you or your business. I think it's a great little insight into mentors, and I'm glad we explored that a little bit. But uh, we need to get into the into the main part of what you're doing, yeah. and uh, you know, this whole idea of wealth creation is something that is, it's a lovely. It's a lovely um, common phrase that is that is used. Yep. It's a phrase that I think people aren't genuinely in touch with, and um, I think it's about um, you know, as well. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot about how people are brought up yep. and you know being restricted by their own 
sense of their own limitations. Yeah, and yeah, you've touched on probably the biggest component of why I do what I do and 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 why there's a market, and that is that financial literacy, wealth creation, money management, whichever one of the terms you want to use, is not taught at school. And therefore, we develop those um, skills, good or bad, from our parents who develop theirs from their parents. And we have to keep in mind that our parents and their parents didn't learn this at a school either. And so if they're good at managing money and growing wealth, then that you might be successful in doing it yourself. If they're not so good or it's not something that is talked about because you know we, we grew up in an era where you didn't talk about money, politics or religion, um, then again, your, your capacity is going to be very limited when it comes to what to do with your money and how to grow it. So it's those, those factors have led to any number of statistics that I could throw at you about why people need this, this uh, knowledge. Uh, the biggest one being that only 5% of Australians will retire with enough money or assets to support their desired lifestyle. The other one is that 80% of people are going to have more life at the end of their money. Yeah, that is, it, it, it's some scary statistics and I definitely, and, and we're going to come, come to that in just a moment. Um, but I, I'm, I want to establish as well is that, that the challenge is having this financial literacy is so important for any of the small business owners and operators out there as well, because often people start a business because they're good at what they do. That does not mean that they're good at the financial side of things. And, uh, you know, I'd have to say to you that my eyes glaze over when it comes to the financials. I can't tell you how many times I've had people sitting me down and explaining balance sheets and all the rest of it. And it is just, um, you know, it's a challenging thing for, you know, someone like myself, who's more of a creative side of things than a financial side of uh, financial understanding. But uh, I'm intrigued as to as, as far as the stuff that you're doing is concerned. Do you focus more on the personal? Do you uh, bring in the business side of things? Where do you find that blend? I think uh, the, the simple answer is it's both uh, because uh, a lot of my clients are business owners and, there's another statistic I'm going to throw at you that uh, there's a very small percentage of businesses that are saleable or sell. And most business owners have wrapped their entire wealth into their business, both their time, their energy, and what it's going to be in the future in terms of creating or selling that business and materialising that into cash that they're going to use for retirement. And they discover too late that they haven't got it. So when I'm dealing with business owners, it's very much about let's, have a plan B. So the business might might be saleable down the track and you might be able to you know, generate a large sum of money and use that for retirement. But let's, in the meantime, use some of what you're generating from the business now to grow your wealth uh, over the long term so there's a backup plan just in case. So they very much are aligned. But when it comes to um, the work I specifically do, it's very much about what's coming into the household income and expenditure scenario and helping people um, manage that from a money perspective and then grow it uh, from an investing perspective from a personal scenario. But we, we've always got the business out to the side as, as a, a part of the equation. Yeah, I, I, and it's, it's a really important lesson for people to uh, understand exactly what you're talking about in that businesses don't sell, mm. you know, not, not easily. And th there's, what is the statistic? It's, it's in excess of 300,000 businesses in Australia will shut down every year. And less than 5% are saleable. Yep. Mm. And it's, and it's, it's scary. Uh, and it, what's even more scary is by the way, that I've talked to a number of business owners where they've actually, got something that strangely would be saleable if they did a few things about it, but decide, nah, I'm just going to shut it down when I'm ready to shut it down. Yeah. And that's the end of it. And so it's, it's a really interesting dilemma on that, in that space. Mm. And, and, you know, so how much is, you know, is it, is it giving them the reality check as you've just done and saying, look, your business is your business and I'm not, that's not necessarily your space of where you're helping them with, 
or is it a case of saying, look, you need to do stuff. You need to also be investing in your business to make it more potential for more saleability in the future. Or is it purely just looking and saying, let's put the business aside and let's look at something else. Yeah. I'm very much about letting other people, um, coach, mentor, you know, help grow, whatever the right terminology is, consult, uh, in terms of the business profitability, growth, saleability, all those type of things. I'm very much about let's take what you're currently deriving from your business and put it to work uh, so that in the future, if you need a plan B, you've got one. Um, and understand and appreciate that you know, the ability to draw out of the business is another aspect of owning a business that a lot of people struggle with. And, and that's the dilemma of how much do I leave in the business versus pay myself? I don't want to pay too much personal tax. And then they get all this cash in the business, but it's doing nothing. It's just sitting there doing nothing. So we've got to, we've got to balance the management of the business and uh, the personal you know, money management and investing for growth and for um, security in the future. Uh, so, yeah, so it, I'm very, very much separating the, the personal financial wealth scenario versus the, the, the wealth that's tied up in the business. But we've obviously got to recognise that it's there. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the scary things that you spoke about before is, is the fact that most people when they retire will not have enough money in their superannuation to last them very long at all. Yeah. And, um, you know, that is a very difficult thing that we as a society have to cope with as well, mm -hmm. because it's, I think the, we could probably talk for hours about this whole idea of superannuation and whether it works or not. Yeah. I, I personally am not convinced that it does for the overwhelming majority of people and that, that perhaps there's more benefit in being able to invest that money in a particular way uh, to benefit your uh, lifestyle rather than putting it into a fund uh, per se, but that is a, a an argument for for another time. Don't get me started um, on that argument. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 yes. Let's uh, let's park that one and have that another time, and and uh, you know perhaps we'll we'll have that uh, in a separate podcast. But I, I'm I'm interested in then that reality that people are facing. When is the right? I mean, I suppose the right time is the earliest time possible. Yeah. But when do people start coming to the realization that they need to? to you know, work with someone such as yourself? Well, I think the easiest way for me to answer that is by just looking at the, the demographics of my customer, customer base and 90% are 40 to 55 years old. And so I think they're coming to that realisation in that uh, age demographic where they're starting to you know, move past the, I guess, the growth of their family and looking after kids and all those type of things and schools and high schools and all that type of stuff. And the entering that age demographic where they're starting to look ahead and go, hang on a minute, I'm doing all of these you know, crazy things with my time and um, you know, working really hard to grow or just keep my head above water. But hang on a minute, retirement's only just around the corner. What have I done about that? And they look at their numbers and go, oh, they're not where I'm going to need them to be. I better actually start getting proactive and do something about it. And no matter how old somebody is, whether they're 33, 43 or 53, every one of them will say to me, oh, I feel like I've left it too late, but can you help me? And it's never too late uh, to do something. Uh, it, might, it might be too late to get you, you know, your ultimate dream, but um, it's never too late to do something and get some things in place to try and improve your position because, you know, the, the thing we were just alluding to, you know, super's not the answer. Mm. So, so where does it where does it start? What is the what are the some of the basics that people should be thinking about? Oh, look, the, the the initial thing is really just understanding what type of lifestyle they want to have, both now and in retirement, and what it's going to take to fund that in the event that you're you know, no longer working. So, a lot of people will come with the idea that they don't want to work till they're sixty five, and want to be able to retire when they choose to retire. So you've got, to, you've got to put some numbers down on what does that look like and where do you need to be to, to, to get to that point. And then it's really just about what resources you um, throw at it as to what you know, speed you'll get there. So the, the real initial, uh, I guess, conversation people are having in their household is I just don't feel like I'm getting everything out of my money that I, sh I could be or should be. 
And that normally comes by just looking at your, uh, for most people, it's you know, their tax return and going, well, you know, it's just, I just don't have the assets that I think I need in order to support myself down the, down the train. And they get a little bit more proactive as a result. But uh, that conversation can happen at any point of the year um, because I think we should be investing consistently. But for most people, they don't think about it until they're forced to do their tax return. Yeah, it is an interesting dilemma, isn't it, that that um, uh, most people, their relationship from a financial point of view, whether it's a financial advisor or an accountant, is generally um, four or five times a year and it's all, you know, tied up with between BAS and tax. Yeah. That is, and, and, and they're negatives, yeah. right? That's the, that's the hardest part is that um, we develop this negativity with money yeah. because that is the only time that we start, you know, really thinking about it and realising how much is going out all the time mm. and not enough going in and, and you know, you and I think that whole idea of when you want to retire, um, I'm sure that age is going to go up, um, mm. is, is the average age of when people retire. I forget what the legal age is, but when people want to retire is going to go up as as life expectancy increases sure. and, and importantly, as inflation and 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 other, um, you know, other things that are happening in the economy, particularly at the moment, mm. where, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to keep, you know, on top of the cost of living. So what you need to retire and what you need to be doing, it, it can be feel like a mountain. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, like the, the, those relationships you were describing are transactional and it's all like compliance and so forth. So... Um, I'm very much about trying to get people to think about their money far more uh, consistently and be more proactive so that uh, they, they're growing their wealth consistently every month and, and not making it something that uh, gets buried. And, that, and I, I come back to that comment I made up front, which was we only think about these. Uh, well, we're not, so we weren't um, brought up to talk about our money. And so it's something that's very much in the background of, of um, day-to-day living. Whereas if more people would um, have that conversation and realise that there's things you can do to grow your wealth without having to slug 40, 50, 60 hours a, a week for somebody else's wealth, or even even if it's your business and you're putting those type of hours in, um, we've got to get the balance right. And you know, life's about now, not down the track. And you, There's too many people that I see who are getting to retirement age and they they no longer got their health to be able to enjoy whatever they've created in the meantime. So I think that getting that balance right is really important. And the only way to do that is to be proactive with your investing so that you can have choice as to when you retire or when you reduce the amount of hours you work because you've got the funds and the assets um, to fund your lifestyle. So when we talk about investing, I mean, that's that's the interesting thing for me as well, is that we're not really taught the whole ideas of the ins and outs of investing itself, mm. um, you know, in, in school. Um, you may have been lucky and your parents may have um, talked a little bit about investing, whether it be it on the share market or, or be it in a, in a property. Mm. Um, but that's usually about the sum total of, of what people know, mm. if they know any of that at all. Yeah. Um, and I imagine that... Um, you know, in this day and age, investing goes beyond those two basic ideas as well. Oh, look, there's a lot more options and there's even within, you know, the stock market or the property market, there's a lot more options than when I first started. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's there's a very broad range of uh, products as such out there that, uh, or strategies even, that people can use. And, you know, if you're not taught them, then you're completely oblivious to them. And, um you know, getting, getting a financial literacy education and, and taking control of your money and your wealth is, is what I'm all about um, because nobody cares more about your money than you do. And so you, you need to be proactive in managing that money and, and learning. You know, it, it always overwhelms me with the number of people that are fearful in, in this country around uh, the stock market. And it's mainly because if you look at the media, you know, what sells media is fear. And so if the stock market's having a bad day, it'll be all over the place. If it's having a stock standard day and just doing its thing and continuing to grow, you won't hear about it. Uh, and so that does you know, generate a lot of fear in the stock market, which we can dispel pretty quickly when you understand how it works and 
and you know the fact that it's just driven by humans anyway and without wanting to go into a big discussion about it i mean you know the modern approach bitcoin and and the like um where do you where do you stand on those kinds of investments Look, i um i'm not convinced with bitcoin i'm one of those rare people at the moment who I don't teach it because I just don't believe the risk profile matches what most people would be comfortable with. And so, you know, if people want to own Bitcoin, I always say to them, don't make it much more than five and maximum 10% of their portfolios because you could wake up tomorrow to be worth half of what it was the night before when you went to bed. And not too many people can live with that type of risk. And so I don't teach it. Um, I'm not, con- I, I, I do believe it's around for the long term, but maybe not you know, in the current structure. Uh, I think banks and um, governments are going to have to work out how they can get, well, they're, they're working on ways to find out how they can get more control of it. And once they get control of it, then uh, it might settle down from a risk perspective. But um, it scares me a little bit and therefore I don't touch it. But uh, I know I know plenty of people who do want to touch it and you know, love it, but uh, I just haven't got there yet. Yeah, I think there's... Um... There's a lot of um, uh, stuff out there that is goes beyond that. I think that I think the difficulty in that space is that it's co- that it's incredibly complex mm. and that it goes beyond the simple idea of oh, uh, do I buy Bitcoin or some other currency that you've you've heard of, mm. um, and then you start talking NFTs and a lot of other things that uh, I think make it incredibly difficult to follow and understand. But I think what is perhaps here to stay is is uh, is particularly the technology around it, that idea of trading uh, in a different way and not having the restrict, you know, having different levels of restrictions. I guess that it's a more fluid twenty four seven market mm. and trading in different things, not necessarily just in straight, you know, a, a version of a currency. Yeah, that's right. I think I think you're right. The technology behind it uh, is very much here to stay, um, but. Yeah, you know, I, I just at the moment, some of the things I hear about you know, the the foundations of, of you know, Bitcoin in particular you know, scare me a little bit. So I just you know I caution people to just be mindful that uh, it's a an asset class, it's an emerging asset class. We don't know enough about you know what it's done in the past to know what it's going to do in the future. And I know there's plenty of people out there who would probably dis- disagree with what I just said, but you know. It just doesn't have the longevity yet to know exactly what it's going to do, and um, therefore it's it's susceptible to you know, major major risk events, and that's not something that you want to tie your wealth up in over the long term. Absolutely, I think it's um, you know very good advice to be cautious, depending on how much you know you know mm-hmm. and how much you're prepared to risk, and that's which I suppose is the same with anything. In fairness, Absolutely. you know, it's it's mm-hmm. if you if you're convinced you want to invest in the Sydney property market, then you're going to do that, even if I turn around and tell you you should you're better off investing in you know pick another city, yeah. and um, it's it's what you know and what you're comfortable with that's always going to make a big difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that comes from confidence. And so that's uh, a, a huge part of what I do is about teaching people to have confidence in their decision making and confidence comes from understanding what they're working with. And so that's what I that's what I educate people on is understanding the, the assets that they may choose to invest in um, because they make all the decisions. I don't make any of their, their investing decisions. I'm about teaching them how to make decisions and understand what it is they're investing in and why uh, so that they know when it does you know, go up in value or fall in value, they know why and they know how to react. And uh, and that's a huge part of it is the confidence side of things. Yeah, I, and, and I think it's such an important area because it, it really is confidence is is a hard thing to get into something like this. Mm. You know, it's I, I still recall um, in my early days of corporate life, I worked with a company that uh, listed on the stock exchange while I was there. Mm. And we were given the opportunity to buy in, at, um, you know, at an, um, before it was released to the to the share market, and um, it was easy, in hindsight, to look back and go, oh, "I should have invested more." <laughs> you know, at the time we were about to renovate a house, mm-hmm. we had already borrowed the money, yeah. and uh, we were a while away from having to use the money. If we'd have invested that money in for that period of time that we had for that, we'd have paid for the renovation. Mm. 
you know, uh, with it. But it's easy in hindsight, and that's the difficulty. And I think the dis- and, and I and I look back and I go, well, why did I make that decision? Well, because I'm incredibly conservative too, because I didn't understand very much about the share market, mm. uh, and, and three, because you know it, it just was a complete lack of confidence in the ability to do that. However, the bit that's the biggest thing in looking back on that is going. Well, if I'd have had an opportunity to have been educated a little bit more and to have developed a little bit of better understanding and therefore confidence in it, it it wasn't actually a difficult decision. It wasn't as big a gamble as it might sound mm. uh, to to have made. Um, would I have done it or not? I, I, I can't tell you, but it's certainly, uh, it's easy, as again, easy in hindsight, yeah. but it's I, I can totally appreciate having that there and and having that education process and i and i imagine is is that the is that the difficult thing with with um a lot of people coming to you is is them sort of firstly recognizing that they have this deficiency a, a little bit but most of the time um when we're talking to people they are fully aware that they just don't have the knowledge so there's two challenges that we hear in in you know, different words that people might use, but the two main things that people are looking for a solution to is the time and a knowledge gap. So they want they, they believe they don't have the time to learn or learn how to invest and uh, or they're running out of time. And then from a knowledge gap point of view is I don't know what to, what to invest in, I don't know how to select it, you know, I don't know how to manage risk, or you know, come up with any of those other variations of that and ultimately that's what we help people solve is the time and the knowledge gap and ultimately that gives them the confidence that they can do it themselves but um, most of the time the people that are coming to us are are aware and that's normally because we potentially we have you know um, triggered their pain point in our content or our advertising to get them to think hey where am I and um, where should I be here? And it's kind of piqued their interest. Yes, I, I, I totally understand uh, how that's the case. And, and I think at a time when we are really struggling, you know, as far as um, keeping up with pricing and keeping up with the cost of living, all those lovely terms that are out there <laughs> and, you know, flooding the media at the moment, um, you know, how much of that is also driving people towards you how much of that is actually making a difference in in what you do and how you go about doing it yeah we absolutely cost of living is huge and it's a very strong motivator for people to get proactive uh, and and being able to get more uh, from the dollar that they're earning Uh, and we we kind of did some survey uh, work both in our business and through my business coach and discovered that there was three main things that are really triggering people at the moment one is how do I pay less tax? How do I pay off my debt more quickly? And how do I grow uh, my assets to produce a passive income? And I believe um, in particular with the paying down debt, that that is very much driven by the cost of living. So we've seen these massive increases in interest rates at a rate you know, far quicker than ever you know, anyone could have planned. And therefore, there's lots of people who are in mortgage prisons, as I, as I you know, use that terminology, is that they can't go and refinance and get a lower rate because they would fail the current uh, assessment for the loan that they already have. So they've got to just live with the one they've got. Uh, and it's making it very hard for them to manage all their other costs, given that they're going up as well. So cost of living is huge as to why people are looking more closely at their money and thinking, I need help. Um, how do I get out of this scenario? And uh, yeah, we're having to tailor uh, a lot more of what we do at that front end page, which is you know, the money management phase, um, before we can dive into the investing phase. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult one, and again, a conversation for another time, perhaps. But I can certainly see how you know sitting in and you're thinking, when is it going to bottom out? When are things going to turn? Which is an interesting one as far as investment is concerned. I, I had a conversation with someone very randomly um, at a, a event I was attending, and I'm not even sure how it started because we were actually leaving the event and it had nothing to do with money. And he was just adamant that 
Sydney property prices were going to drop. Yeah. And I said to him, look, in, you know, I've lived in the uh, eastern suburbs of Sydney my entire life and I don't recall prices ever dropping. Yeah. There have been times when they may have flattened a little bit, yeah. um, but even then, that's for a moment. They've just continued to rise. Mm. And, um, you know, this uh, idea, and, and I think in many respects, it, property in Australia has been, the primary investment that people have always seen, I remember being brought up and saying, well, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to pay off your mortgage. Mm. Now the reality is, is you probably never pay off your mortgage. You, you just you, you just get to the point where you downsize. Mm. Yeah, and I think what I'm also observing, and you know, I've got um, uh, kids in their, their mid, mid-20s who are you know, living this experience, but um, the, the younger generation, you know, and in between my kids and my my generation, um, they're not as fixated on owning bricks and mortar and paying off a mortgage if it impacts their lifestyle. So there's more and more people who are happy enough to rent and live where they want to live and then invest elsewhere and have the freedom to be able to move around with their, their living experience um, at, rather than being tied to a property and a mortgage because that's what our parents did and that's what everyone told us we should do. Um, and I, I actually, I actually believe there's there's a lot of merit in that, and that, um, like you said, with the current interest rates, current property prices, the fact that wages are still probably ten years behind in in terms of purchasing power, it makes a whole lot more sense to live where you want to live, and you know invest where the market's growing, um, so that uh, you have the best of both worlds. As someone who's uh, having to rent at the moment while I'm building a house, um, rent prices are insane, and that's where the um, th- that's where you have got a problem. You know they've continued to rise at such a ridiculous amount. I know in my area, and I spoke to several people in the, in the area uh, that um, earlier this year they went up by twenty three percent. And quite specifically, by twenty three percent in everyone's case. And, um, I'm not going to say there was collusion amongst anyone there, but it's but it's um, mm-hmm. coincidental, um, happy coincidence. But it, and it's and it's not sustainable. I mean, that's the that's the hard part is that the flow on effects of that are either forcing people to move out of the area, and that comes with its own consequences because it depends on whether there is accommodation to go to in the first place. Mm-hmm. It also is practicality and so you've got people living beyond their means or having to cut lots of other things in order to be able to sustain rents and so again this whole idea of investing and being able to get out of that um you know out of that situation is um a difficult one i'm lucky enough that i did you know invest in property very early on in the piece Mm. And so, you know, the rental idea is a short-term one while we while we build, but it's, um, you know, it's a painful one and it's eaten massively into our budget. It's money being thrown away for, well, what will amount to a good couple of years. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, is, it is a challenge. We're in a very challenging environment. Uh, we've seen a massive amount of uh, migration uh, to catch up for COVID. And everyone's looking for properties. We just and with the cost of you know, building going, and you'd be experiencing this yourself with the cost of building going through the roof, uh, raw materials and all of that going through the roof. It's just it's become this snowball. And I I often do um, videos where I'm looking at news in the financial markets and pulling apart the story. And the unfortunate part with interest rates is it's a sledgehammer approach that becomes self fulfilling. And so we've got a, an, an arrangement where interest rates have kept going up, which forced prices to go up, which forced rents to go up, which forced you know property prices to go up, and it just became self fulfilling, and still is. And you know, interest rates aren't necessarily the answer to bring prices down. You know, it's a it's a sledgehammer to stop us from spending. But you know, if interest rates keep going up, then rents are going to keep going up, which going to just fuel more inflation, which they're going to say, well, what, how do we get control of this inflation if everything keeps going up? So I, I get quite on my high horse on that one, but um, you're right. Like there's an absolute shortage of properties, uh, which is causing rents and you know, um, property prices to keep going up. And 
you know, it's something that's going to have to be dealt with at much higher levels than what I do. Um, I just try and help people manage their way out of the scenario in a way that they're comfortable with, whether it's renting or buying or both. Um, it's it's a, about what works for them. So talk to me a little bit about as well. I know we, we spoke about before we started recording about you've got a, a wealth tracker. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more about that because we're going to make it available for people to uh, to download um, access to that. But give me a little bit of insight into what, what that's all about and how it helps people. Yeah, so the wealth tracker is uh, a workbook designed to enable people to track how they're going with their money and their wealth. And ultimately, a great tool to see how you're going month after month and a little bit of Ninja built into it with a dashboard that is designed to tap into uh, our money mindset. So we've got three parts to our brain. And there's one part that if it sees us doing something good, it'll actually encourage us to keep doing whatever's getting those good results. So the Wealth Tracker and the dashboard in particular is that tool we use to keep us motivated, to keep doing what's getting the positive results. So it's our our support mechanism uh, to keep us going because investing is not something we do for eight or ten weeks of the year. It's something you should be doing all the time. And so that Wealth Tracker, whilst it's a great place to see all the numbers, it's also tapping into that motivational tool in our head that says, I like what you're doing, keep doing it. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a way to track your shares, your properties, your superannuation, your personal household budget, your cash balances, and see it all in one dashboard and hopefully see it going upwards month after month and therefore motivate you to keep doing what's getting those results. I love the idea that it's built on that whole idea of that dopamine hit because it's one of the reasons why we are unsure of what we're doing and not don't do the things because we don't get that. And, and if you're just relying on looking at a share market every day and going, has it gone up, has it gone down? You, you, you're setting yourself up for failure really on that, isn't it? Because there aren't many stocks that you're going to say, right, if I invest today, it'll go up tomorrow and the next day and the next day, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, being able to find ways to get that, that hit is incredibly important. Yeah. And absolutely, it's, um, like I said, it's a great tool to use. Uh, I encourage people to use it when they're, uh, presenting their numbers to banks and show them that they're in control of their numbers. They know what they're doing and all that. But at the same time, using that dashboard, and I, I use the analogy all the time of diets. You know, the diet industry is worth trillions of dollars a year around the world. And it's not because diets don't work. It's because most people go into a diet to, and use willpower as their sole tool for success. And we know from science that willpower on its own doesn't work over the long term. So the same with wealth. If you're going to stay the journey and do it month after month, year after year to get the results you want, you need something to keep you motivated. And so the dashboard is designed to, like you said, give you that dopamine hit that says, wow, I'm getting, I'm going forward. I'm making progress. I'll just keep doing what's getting those results. And eventually you'll get to where you want to be. Fantastic. So thank you so much for making that available to people who are listening to the podcast. Yeah. And we will uh, include that in the show notes. So before we wrap things up, um, I just wanted a couple of things that I wanted to ask you. One is that, you know, we, we talked a little bit in the beginning about how you got to where you are, but what was the what was the dream when you first started out, when you were in school? Where, were, where was the career going at that point? Uh, that, that's an interesting question. And I was explaining this to somebody the other day about how I you know, became so passionate about what I now do. I, I played squash um, against men at a young age. So I was uh, playing men's comp midweek at the age of 14. And I played a season of squash, which was over about four months. There was two seasons a year, and the, the season went for roughly four months. And the guys that I was playing with, the team of five people, three of them were in the financial markets. And so for the entire season, they got in my head as a 14-year-old about um, why it's important to get your money working for you so you don't have to work for it. And that was just drilled into me for four and probably longer than that because there was pre-season and, and so forth. So I just copped this message at a young age and I then became fascinated by initially the stock market and how you could invest today and then in 10 years it'd be worth more and 20 years even more and so forth. And I just got completely 
engulfed in the idea that I could invest and not have to work for anybody. And that really uh, triggered that um, that uh, genie in the, in the bottle type of thing and got me into that. And I ended up working as a chartered accountant for a long time. So I was always dealing with numbers and numbers just seem to flow for me. I can, I see the world often in numbers and it just became a passion. And um, so when I first started out, uh, I didn't really want to be an accountant, but that's where I ended up going, you know, being a chartered accountant and working in one of the big firms and doing all that type of stuff. But I knew that wasn't what I really wanted to do. And, um, you know, I guess that training was spectacular for what I'm now doing in terms of I can read numbers, I can dispel the, mis- you know, the, the mystery of numbers, but it all came about all the way back from when I was 14, just having these people in my ear week after week about you, know, you don't want to have to work for the rest of your life. Amazing. It's amazing those influences and what they, what they have on you from such an early age. Yeah. And um, uh, here's a little bit of... Um, trivia wrapped around all of that first of all are there many squash courts around anymore because (laughs) i can't remember the last time i saw a squash court or anyone talk about squash but my first property that i bought was a converted squash court i converted squash courts into an apartment and i remember people thinking a squash court into an apartment but actually a squash court was as i learned was 65 square meters which is a very big one bedroom apartment as uh, was my my first investment i did have a wonderful um housewarming party all my friends decided to dress up in squash gear and (laughs) bring the gatorade and everything along to spark the memories of it but it was a it was a wonderful first uh first apartment to have um so there you go so i had a similar experience my junior i played my junior squash on saturdays and the squash courts I played out of were threatened to be taken over many, many times by developers. And eventually it happened. And they're now, you know, they're a, um, a combination of, you know, retail space and apartments. And we had to go and find new courts to play in. And um, yes, the number of squash centres in, in Sydney and Australia is rapidly diminishing because, as yes, you said, the real estate is very, very valuable. Yes, I think it's – and what's interesting is is so uh, those squash courts disappeared because I started living in it. Yeah. The other squash courts that I used, I didn't play squash all that often, but um, became a consulate. Right. So um, <laughs> um, there you go. Yeah. Different uses, but the real estate is nonetheless uh, quite valuable. Um, final question that I wanted to ask you before we go is a question I like to ask all of my guests is what's the aha uh, moment that uh, clients have when they start working with you that you wish more people knew about uh, in advance? Uh, I love that question because I love the aha that comes up and that's when they realise that investing is not that complicated. And I often say in my my sales presentation to people that my strategy is simple and it's simple for two reasons. One, it has to be repeatable by people other than me and the other one is that I believe banks and financial institutions overcomplicate wealth so we feel obligated to pay them to do it for us so they make all the money and us not so much. So the aha moment I get to see is when people uh, realise that they can do it and they're making money off the the decisions that they've made from what I've taught them and they realise that they could do it for the rest of time. What a fabulous way to finish the program. Uh, thank you so much for being generous with your time and uh, giving us so many insights. Uh, I really appreciate everything that you've uh, given over in that. And of course, the link to the um, Wealth Tracker spreadsheet, of course, will be available in the show notes as well as all the information on how to get in contact with you as well. Yes. Andrew, thanks so much for your time. Anthony, thank you so much for having me. It's been a great conversation. Hey, thanks for listening to Biz Bites. We hope you enjoyed the program. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Biz Bites is proudly brought to you by Podcast Done For You, the service where we will deliver a podcast for you and expose your brilliance to the world. Contact us today for more information. Details in the show notes. We look forward to your company next time on Biz Bites.